Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Helen Riley. I am CFO of X and a devout fantasy and sci-fi nerd, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jennifer Acker and Naomi Bagdanes today to talk about their new book, Humor Seriously. If you have any questions for Naomi or Jennifer, I encourage you to submit them since we will be taking audience questions later in the talk. And with that, let me introduce our two guests. Dr. Jennifer Acker is general partner, uh, general Atlantic professor at the Stanford GSB and a leading expert on how purpose and meaning shape individual choices and how technology can positively impact well-being. Her work has been widely published in leading scientific journals and featured in The Economist, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, among others. And she's the co-author of several books, including the award-winning The Dragonfly Effect. A recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award, Jennifer counts winning a dance-off in the early 1980s among her greatest feats. So welcome, Jennifer. Naomi Bagdanas is an experienced designer, executive advisor, and leading expert in the intersection of humor and business. She teaches at Stanford's GSB and facilitates interactive sessions for the boards and leadership teams of Fortune 100 companies and nonprofits. First in behavioral science, human perception, and professional comedy, she advises executives and celebrities on events ranging from appearances on Saturday Night Live and the Today Show to company all hands meetings and political campaign speeches. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, among others, and on her mother's fridge. In her spare time, Naomi runs a teaching program, a program teaching improv comedy in San Francisco's county jail and fosters a revolving door of rescue dogs whom she adores and who systematically destroy everything she owns. And with that, welcome Naomi. Hello, wonderful to be here. Great Thank to you. be here. Also, your accent makes us sound all very fancy and important. <laughs> That's what everybody tells me. And with that, let's dive straight in. So what prompted you to write this book? I read the book, I absolutely loved it, um, but it's, not, it's a non-obvious topic. So I'd love to hear what prompted you to write it. Yeah, well, Jennifer and I came to this body of work from very different angles, sort of opposite angles. So for me, I always grew up obsessed with humor and comedy, and I spent my career essentially straddling the worlds of business and improv comedy. And all the while, I sort of was keeping these worlds separate because I figured no one in the comedy world thought that working a corporate job was very cool. And no one in the corporate world thought that working, uh, you know, nights and weekends doing improv was going to be very impressive. Um, so I essentially realized in my mid 20s that I was totally leading a double life, that it was unsustainable. And I was pretty unhappy and not making friends at work. So I, I personally started on this mission to merge those two selves, to have more fun at work, hopefully, um, you know, and hopefully be more successful as well. And through that, I realized, oh my gosh, humor is not just something that makes me feel more authentic, but it actually can be incredibly powerful for me at work. So that was my journey to this body of work. Jennifer's was kind of the opposite. Yes, not only did I not really ever think that humor was important, I always felt that humor was, so I had no double life. Um, I had a single life and it was really, it was just so focused, you know, on research and, um, and you know, the work that I do, I'm obvious, I, you know, I have friends, like, it's not like I'm humorless, but certainly I never thought that humor was a really important thing. I'm definitely not in work. Um, um, I started changing the way that I viewed humor and how important it might be, especially in a work context, but more generally, um, because I worked with um, many people who had leukemia about eight years ago after uh, my husband and I wrote this book, The Dragonfly Effect. We ended up um, helping kids that had leukemia try to find matches in the bone marrow registry or outside the bone marrow registry for them. And in that process, just met a wide swath of uh, people. One of them was a guy named Amit Gupta and he had leukemia. There was no match in the bone marrow registry for him. He needed to find one, but here's the thing. He, he used humor to do it. You know, his friends had this incredible sense of humor. They brought in comedians like Aziz Ansari and Chris Pratt 
at the time he was less of an actor and more of a comedian. And they would do PSAs to get people to be motivated to give a spit about cancer and um, and be put in the bone marrow registry. They would have bars, you know, you know, parties where people, you know, they would bring their South Asian friends and and have them give a spit and get into the bone marrow registry. So everything he approached was with levity. And he found a perfect match in a very short period of time. And just through his actions and his approach of humor and levity to find um, a hopeful match for himself, he ended up finding a match for I think over 250 people in the year after he found a perfect match. So it just made me start reflecting on how humor can actually drive action. It can mobilize communities and it can shrink the distance between people so everyone can feel like they're on the same page. And that's what started me on my humor journey. Well, definitely, you have both have very different approaches that brought you to this topic. Um, I have so many questions already for both of you based on those based on those intros. So, Naomi, maybe if I can start with you, I know there's actually an extraordinary um, little story in the book about this sort of dual life, effectively, that you were leading. And yes. I think someone actually put a mirror up to you. So I'd love to for you to sort of expand on that story. But it also yeah. leads me to sort of the question of this like false dichotomy between gravity and levity, because the reality is so many of us have been conditioned in our sort of early professional careers to actually separate um, these two sides of our lives, partly because we've lived with this false impression that humor compromises whether we're taken seriously or not, when in reality, I think one of the things you say in the book is that it's the balance of the two is what gives power to both. So I'd love to hear about their story and then also hear your reflections on this. Yeah, is case, this is my horrifying realization um, about the kind of life that I was leading. And this was, um, I was maybe 24, 25. And remember, I was doing improv nights and weekends. I was having so much fun. And I was doing so well at my job, which was at a large consulting firm. I was sort of climbing the ranks faster than expected. And I um, I just felt like I was really, you know, doing great at work. And uh, so I had this client named Bonnie. And Bonnie and I had been working together for months. We'd probably spent 100 hours, like, side by side working together. And she knew me really, really well. And it was a Friday afternoon. And, you know, we were sort of, we were about to part ways and bantering. And she said, by the way, Naomi, I... Uh, I bet I know exactly what you do with your Friday nights, which is objectively a weird thing for a client to say to you. But again, we had sort of grown close. So I um, I said, OK, Bonnie, what do you think I do with my Friday nights? And she said, well, I bet that you go home uh, by yourself. You watch History Channel documentaries uh, with your with your cat and um, and you re iron your blouses for next week. Now, this is not a bad Friday night. This is fine. If anyone has this Friday night out there, that's awesome. This was just so backwards from my life. And and so it was this moment. Naomi irons, but she doesn't re-iron. Just want to be clear. I don't even iron. I steam. <laughs> Why does anyone iron? Steaming is so much easier. Yeah, I just um it just wasn't my life. And she sort of, you know, I kind of poked, I, I pulled this out of her, and she basically told me that she didn't think I had a sense of humor. And so it was exactly what you said, Helen, where she held this mirror up to me and made me realize that the person who was showing up at work each day was not someone who my friends would recognize, was not someone who my family would recognize. I was doing, I was kicking butt at work, but I was just having absolutely no fun. And uh, and it, it led me to this exploration of why is it that we believe we have to be a certain way, we have to have a facade at work, um, when in reality, the research tells a completely different story that that if we're able to bring more levity, if we're able to bring a fuller range of ourselves and have more fun, then we'll actually be more successful in the process. That is so true. Go, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was just going to uh, chime in. Um, first of all, steaming noted. Yes. Um, I still have an iron. Lesson but, learned. Um, <laughs> but Naomi's story is not unusual. Um, and, you know, as she said before, you know, once she actually started bringing humor more into the work life, you know, she, she, she and we all become even more effective in a surprising way. 
Um, I remember um, we um, had Secretary of State Madeleine Albright come into our class at Stanford, and she told us about the time the Russian government had bugged the U.S. State Department, um, which is a serious breach in international diplomacy. And so after learning about the bugging, though, uh, what uh, Secretary Albright did was she arrived at her next meeting with the Russian foreign minister wearing an enormous bug pen. Like it, it, was, it was ginormous. And he couldn't help but smile. And the energy in the room shifted. She sh uh, shared how the conversation completely shifted. And the story, you know, I think illuminates two things. One is humor is a choice. Uh, one that we can make in these small moments, but also big ones. And that, as you said, the balance of gravity uh, can give power to both. So even in the most serious of moments, when you bring a sense of humanity and levity and humor to it, it often um, shifts the entire course of how, you know, the conversations can go and the outcomes can be revealed. Well, and exactly to that point, I think that's one of the things that's most powerful about the story you told about sort of trying to raise money for cancer and actually it was the power of humor that was able to be the most powerful way to influence people and to grab people's attention than potentially any other methods. So exactly to that point, you actually talk in the book about how humor benefits us in so many different ways, not just in our personal lives, but it makes us happier. It makes us less stressed, but it also brings a ton of business, a, a ton of benefits and in negotiation and, and in business on a number of different dimensions. So can you actually help us understand more? What is it about humor that you know, conveys higher status? It can make us seem smarter. It can unlock creativity. Help us understand how something like humor can have so many positive effects on so many dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, just some basic stats. Leaders with a sense of humor are seen as 27% more motivating and admired any sense of humor. Their employees are 15% more engaged. Uh, the teams that work for them tend to be twice as creative because, you know, tension is often diffused and you can take greater risks. And as you mentioned, they can even make more money. So in one of our favorite studies, um, the uh, researchers show that even adding a lighthearted line at the end of a sales pitch, like my final offer is X and I'll throw in my pet frog makes people willing to pay nearly 20% more. Really let it sink in how bad that joke is. Yikes. The bar is so low. <laughs> and that is a, an enormous effect size. And part of it, it's chemical. You know, you ask like, why is this happening? And people often think that, you know, what humor does is a psychological phenomenon, but it's not, it's really neurochemical. When people laugh together, our brain releases this cocktail of hormones. So we release endorphins, which gives us something similar to a runner's high. Um, our cortisol decreases, very you know, sort of similar to a meditative feeling. And we also release dopamine, which is the same hormone released during sex. So in essence, as far as our brains are concerned, laughing together is similar to exercising, meditating, and having sex all at the same time, but logistically much easier. And what's also important is that when our brain shifts, it's, it doesn't just impact how we see ourselves and how we act, but it also impacts how others see us and how others end up acting. And so the reasons why creativity can be accelerated or productivity oftentimes can as well, or people see you with greater sense of competence or status is large, largely in part due to this kind of neurochemical effect as well. And then the ripple effects that come from it. But to that point, if there is this positive neurochemical effect, why are we censoring it out of our lives? It almost seems counterintuitive that we're not relying more heavily on humor. Why do you think that is? I mean, one of the most depressing things that you talk about in the book is the humor cliff. Like we have so much laugh out loud, so many laugh out loud experiences when we're young kids. And then that just drops off when we enter the workforce. And yet you're talking about all of these positive benefits. So why are we self-censoring ourselves? First of all, um, that's awesome that you're like, you have a list of all of the depressing things in our book, like <laughs> and one of the more depressing things among the large number of depressing facts. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on that. Totally. Bring, it, bring it on. 
<laughs> Could not agree more. Um, yeah, I mean, we we delve into these four myths in the book. What are the myths that exist that hold people back from using humor? One of them, of course, is the serious business myth. That's the idea that if you take your work or your mission seriously, the presence of humor betrays that mission. And as Jennifer shared with the stats, we just find in the research this, that this is not true. There's also a cultural component to this where um, we teach a course at Stanford called A New Type of Leader Anchored on Purpose Fueled by Humor. And the thesis of that course is that traditional models of leadership are shifting and that it used to be that leaders needed to be revered, now they need to be understood. So we need to have leaders that have more vulnerability, that have more authenticity, that balance approachability with status. And one really powerful way to do that is humor. So I'll say first, there's a cultural shift that's happening in the forms of leadership that are effective. And the second thing is you asked why this happens. Well, one big reason has to do with status. When we are lower in status in an organization, we have to prove credibility before we can show humor. Because of course, if we show up and we just have humor and it's not balanced with some cred, then people are gonna, uh, are gonna downplay our, our abilities and our status. And so like I did in my early 20s, I entered the workforce and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't have any sense of humor here. I need to be completely serious. Um, and then as we rise in status in an organization, we don't rethink that model. And so what we find is that managers and leaders have are now deeply ingrained, it's now become deeply ingrained in them that they need to be serious all the time to be successful. And in fact, that, that model shifts, that when you rise in status in an organization, a sense of humor, a sense of vulnerability, approachability becomes more and more powerful, more status enhancing, more beneficial for your, for your orgs and your teams, but we don't necessarily shift our mindset as we shift in status. Yeah, that definitely resonates with, with me. I think one of the things as you rise up through an organization is those competing sort of desires on the one hand to be taken seriously and credibly, but in, as you put your sort of serious face forward, it also results in potentially less approachability. And I think that this is something that a lot of leaders and particularly women struggle with. Can you talk about ways therefore in which leaders can address some of these tensions that they feel to actually create more rapprochement with, with the people that they work with and sort of increase that approachability? Totally. Oh, go ahead, Jennifer. You oh, might you're muted. Want to um, so what you do is you first mute yourself and then you start on a really impressive sort of actually one of our um, dear friends and someone who teaches with us, uh, who is um, the co-CEO of a large nonprofit called Merit America, um, has used humor in very kind of similar ways. So as a leader, just understanding it can be done in small easy, free, intentional ways, you know, just like I did, um, is is part of this. So um, Connor D. Mignon, he's the co-CEO of Merit America. He teaches with us. And, you know, it, it was about, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, early 2020, uh, just weeks after the world went into quarantine. And he's leading his first virtual offsite with his entire organization. And people are exhausted and scared. It's tense. So he's sharing a few slides and before passing to a teammate to speak, he intentionally leaves his screen share on and the entire team thinking it's a mistake, watches as he closes down his PowerPoint, he opens up Google Chrome and he types in things inspirational CEOs say during hard times. And everyone laughs. It's this beautiful moment and it had a real upside for Connor because of all of the statistics we just shared with you, not only shifted how they viewed him as, you know, actually greater in status, but also authentic, um, but it also empowered them to use humor and levity as well. So one answer to the question is just knowing it's not necessarily about being funny per se, it's really about using humor in small intentional ways at the right moment to diffuse tension, read the room. Um, Connor, uh, Naomi, what were you gonna say with your mute? You were perfect. Office. Oh no, my, um, my timed, the timed lights in the office went out, so I had to grab pieces of tissue and throw them across the room so that the sensor would go off. So that's what I was doing. <laughs> Got to reset that sensor. 
<laughs> so if you see me just like frantically doing something like this, I'm just throwing tissues uh, over. And it. actually <laughs> what Naomi's doing right now, which was not planned, is like what another is thing is just like calling, you know, as a leader at Parlor Bridge, just calling it, right? Just calling yeah. the truth because everyone's, everyone's been in these situations. And so just calling it um, is another, a second, you know, concrete little tip. Yeah, well, maybe we can hear more of those uh, those tips. Like, as you said, like I think a lot of people freak out about the idea that they need to be funny. You've worked with world-renowned comedians on your journey to understanding what it means to be funny. Are there more tips that you can share with us about finding our funny? Yes. Okay. So biggest tip is if you want to have more humor in your life, don't look for what's funny. Just look for what's true. So become an observer of your life. Look for little oddities or incongruities or the fact that you're on, uh, you know, an important call right now and you're in your throwing tissues across the room. Whatever it is that's a little bit weird and ridiculous about your life, it's there. Just start noticing it. So what we have our students do is write, uh, write down observations at the end of each day for one week. And these can be really simple things like um, how exhausting socializing is. Uh, I was noticing the other day that I don't know how to leave a conversation because there's no leave button, right? So you sort of are like, okay, you know, I've now become a lingerer. So this is just a true observation about myself. Um, other observations, ants cannot be destroyed. I don't know how they do it, but they can't. Um, I'm not currently wearing shoes uh, and I'm not currently wearing pants. So there you go. Some observations. That one maybe isn't true. But um, but all you do is you just look around your life and notice these simple true things. Um, and that's the first route to humor. Um, the reason that we have our students do this and the reason that I recommend that every single person starts at the end of each day writing down five things that are just remotely humorous, a little bit interesting or humorous, is that this is really not about becoming a comedian. It, it's, it's about navigating our lives in a different way and looking at the world in a different way. Um, there's, there's a psychological principle called the priming effect that says our brains are wired to see what we've been set up to expect. So in essence, we find what we choose to look for. And when we navigate our lives on the precipice of a smile, um, instead of being frustrated by the tissue throwing, being a little bit delighted by it, you know, and sharing it with someone, then it changes the way we interact with the world and it changes the way that people interact back. So that's my single biggest tip is like write down observations that are interesting um, or a little bit, a little humorous. And Google has such a great, um, you know, sort of history of this too. You know, Sarah Cooper, who comes into our class, Every year, she um, was at Google, and a lot of the, the the comedic work that she did also was kind of born of observations that she made, you know, in these in these large tech companies. Definitely, um, one one topic we haven't touched on yet is the benefits to creativity of uh, of humor. So. I know that you um, interviewed and worked with Astro Teller, who, of course, I work with really closely um, at X. And he actually talked about his bad idea brainstorms, which I participate in and absolutely love. But maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what makes these brainstorms such a powerful tool for unlocking new ideas. And I'd love, I mean, you interviewed so many leaders. It'd be really helpful for us to hear more about other best practices from other leaders that we can all benefit from. Sure. So a quick anecdote about Astro. Um, and, you know, he's such an intuitive, you know, scientist um, at, you know, unlocking and, and leading with some of the basic premises of the class. It was just a joy um, to kind of observe him. But, you know, he would comment on things like, you know, if he, you know, would tell the group, um, you know, go brainstorm good ideas, for example, people would think, oh, my God, you know, everything I need to say has to be perfect or at least good. And even just using the word good puts limits on the way his you know, team would think. But if he said this is a bad idea, brainstorm and the silliest, stupidest ideas are fantastic. That is, in fact, the goal. People would come up with these crazier and often better solutions. Um, and these brainstorms would, would have often ludicrous ideas, but oftentimes those were the ones that actually made it in. And part of this is just 
you know, diffusing pressure, making it okay to be normal, and um, and that would unlock these more creative selves. A small anecdote, Naomi and I took this to an extreme. When we started working on our, our book proposal, we caught, um, inspired by Astro, we called it a really shitty book proposal, you know, just to like lower the bar. And then- <laughs> As context, it's like, it's kind of intimidating to write a book proposal. It's gotta be 50 pages long and you start with a blank page. I mean, it's, yeah. So we were really intimidated and then until this. Well, but that's definitely gonna get people's attention. We did, we kept it on, we kept the title on and then the book took off and the rest is history. So I think the moral of this story is bad idea brainstorms and really shitty drafts are the way to go. The the small hiccup here is so Jennifer and I you know we had a we had a Google Doc that we wrote our entire proposal we actually wrote our entire uh, book in a Google Doc and so we had this Google Doc and just internally we're like you know what let's call it a really shitty proposal and it'll lower the bar for ourselves we'll make it fun well when we shared the proposal with our agent we forgot to retitle the document because we just shared the google doc and so our agent gets this proposal entitled a really shitty proposal and she's like uh okay turns out she loved it so much and she thought it was funny that she submitted it to the publishers with the title a really shitty proposal and our book got you know eventually picked up by a publisher with that title so that was how a totally ridiculous inside joke turned into us selling a book. I absolutely love that idea. Did you worry at all that it might backfire though? Like how do you juggle that, that fear of like, on the one hand, it is absolutely hysterical what you just described, but at the same time, people can look at it and think, what are they thinking? I think the humor actually, you know, attracts like-minded people. So for example, um, the publisher we worked with, she had the same, instincts and then she encouraged us definitely supported us it became a really shitty chapter one a really shitty chapter two a really shitty chapter three and i think um humor bonds people right we never even met her but she thought it was actually funny and that um you know it shrinks the distance between two people um these inside jokes or these similar ways of viewing the world um I, this was a long, a big, long reach, but I remember I had a title of a, a talk called Beyond Crack Cocaine and Andy Barrett at Google found it. He's like, we, we must have this at Google. So like, you know, if it was like on happiness and productivity, it wouldn't have gotten any attention, but Beyond Crack Cocaine was helpful. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're very inspired by Astro and, and what, what, you know, Google has done and X and, and yeah. many of the things that you you practice, Helen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I you, you've talked a little bit about sort of leaders and what they can do to, to bring humor into their lives. It makes them more approachable. It just makes them more respected as leaders. But Naomi, you have hosted a fabulous workshop um, at X with my team. And there were some great suggestions and tips for anybody just, just to bring more humor into their lives and into their working environment. Um, and actually, you know, some of my teams now begin their meetings with a haiku and, you know, accompanied by some very creative and often self-deprecatory um, memes. Can you talk more about sort of other tips that you can share with everybody who's on this call just about how we can be more proactive and make that choice, as you said earlier, of bringing more humor into our lives more generally and into our work lives specifically? Totally. So there are all these small hacks that um, that our former students have come back and said are are really meaningful to them. One of them is so small, and it is what word you use to sign off your emails. So Helen, before uh, what what did you use to sign off your emails before we came and spoke at at X? Uh, a pretty boring one word. Thanks. Right. So thanks, best, kind regards, warmly. And so people kind of skim over them and don't even notice them. One really simple hack is sign off your um, your emails with anything but. So you could sign off with, you know, throwing tissues to activate the light sensor. You could sign off with pet frogs or, you know, with levity and Lysol or whatever it is that's relevant to especially you and your relationship with the person. Um, and it completely changes the dynamic. So everyone who's listening right now, the next email you send I want you to sign off with anything lighthearted. 
And if you get an awesome response, then please forward it to us because we love hearing those stories. Um, so that's one. And then another one that we see uh, teams do is hanging levity on existing rituals. So oftentimes a, you know, a manager can think, oh gosh, well, I have to do something totally big and bold um, to have some levity here. And actually sometimes the more effective way is to say, what are the rituals you already have? Um, are there team communication channels? Are there all hands or daily stand-up meetings? And how do you bake a little bit of humor into those? So, um, so at Merit America, for example, um, they, at the beginning of every all hands meeting, they spotlight two employees and they ask them to do two truths and a lie with everyone. And so it's a great way to get to know them, to get to know, um, you know, some details about them. And, um, and it just sort of is a lighthearted way to start the meetings. And then the, the other, my other favorite recent example is teams doing what's called, um, uh, comedy roulette. So in Comedy Roulette, every member of the team submits a two-minute uh, video, work-appropriate video, to uh, to a person who's compiling them. And then at the beginning of every meeting, for you know, until they run out of videos, the person plays one of those videos, and everyone has to guess who submitted that video. And so it's this really fun way to get to know each other's humor styles and to have humor without it feeling so high stakes, where someone needs to be funny. So those are just a couple examples, a couple of hacks and ways that other people are doing it. But um, but I think the main thing is figure out what feels authentic to you and your team and just start prioritizing it. And Helen, can we ask you a question? Um, of course, you can't say no. But <laughs> you had three or four pages of like margin to margin notes based off that workshop. Like what was one thing that you remembered or deployed or the team has like you know, used and, and has that effect. Yeah, no, I, I actually pulled my team, like what actually stuck in their, their minds. I mean, there's two or three things that I do whenever I'm sending notes to my team, they used to be very dry and boring and sort of very sort of factual and summarizing a topic. And now I've just inserted memes and just fun pictures. And it just, that's the first thing that they see before they even read, just to sort of shake things up. And I've been, very creatively coming up with haiku and all like six word stories for things and just inserting them. And it, honestly, it's just, it completely changes the tone. And I also think it's changed people's perceptions of me as a leader as well. So I have to say that the workshop was incredibly valuable and I certainly encourage others to spend time with um, Naomi and, uh, and Jennifer. I think another example is, um, you know, I was reading your bios. It's kind of, kind of cool that like your biggest, you know, one of your biggest feats that you remember from your life, Jennifer, is a, a dance off in the 80s. And Naomi, it sounds like your house is getting totally destroyed by dogs. I think that's another right. great tip, which I know stuck in the minds of so many of my team, just to add that one liner, which is such a huge differentiating factor if you're applying for a job or if you're just whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, mm. just to differentiate yourself and just inject a little bit of fun. So actually lots of things stick. And I did promise you I'd send that list. So I have compiled <laughs> it and I will send it over to you. Um, but on that point, like, I'd love to hear more ideas. You know, I work, I have the privilege of working really closely with Ed Catmill from, um, from Pixar and he's now um, works with us at, at X. Um, and there's lots of great uh, stories that you talk about from Pixar, but you know, taking it a little further, like people paying pranks on one another. But, you know, I, I guess there's two, two parts to this question. First of all, I'd love to hear more of those examples, and like why they worked so well um, mm. at Pixar. But secondly, how do you actually make sure that you're not crossing over into sort of a gray area where, because humor fails are also very real. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on that too. Yeah, on, on the Pixar thing, first, we were so blessed. Um, Ed Catmull, the former president of Pixar, he, um, he not only um, wrote our foreword, but he also titled our book. Naomi was having dinner with him um, a couple years ago, and I think we were going to call it Humor is Serious Business or something like our class. And he's like, humor? Seriously. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, seamlessly, and boom, there was the title. But, you know, he really describes um, in the foreword of the book, especially, just how important it was not just to have these pranks and these moments of levity at Pixar, but 
um, how important it was for him to actually endorse them and, and be involved in them. You know, there were so many difficult and serious financial and cultural problems that he was facing. And in those moments, he says that those were the exact times where what he said as a leader didn't matter. You know, those just, you know, those words just washed over everyone. But what people grabbed onto was how he behaved. Um, and that means a few things for him. For one, it meant, you know, admitting failures and taking actions that really demonstrated real values. Um, but also doing so with this healthy dose of humor. Um, and that would also, you know, create this, you know, perspective, um, you know, garner empathy and, and I think just put the mistakes that were made or the challenges they had in this bigger context. And he found it um, to be so important that he, I think also said, you know, when you bring humor to the most dire of situations, most challenging um, parts of the job, you actually create greater meaning at work as well. And the important thing here is that words matter very little, but it's your behaviors, those pranks and those moments that actually, that, that are remembered and matter. And so um, we've, again, been so inspired by that. Um, you know, in our class, there's definitely pranks, um, water balloon pranks and, you know, dress up pranks and things like that. And they tend to be memorable and defining and the students just feel like they're part of the culture and it creates that culture of trust. By water balloon pranks, she means on the last day of class one year, all of our students, because we, we're totally like, listen, if you want to play pranks in this class, go for it. If you have a weird idea, bring it to us and we'll do it, right? We want to create the culture that we're telling you that we believe in. And so on the last day of class, a couple of years ago, um, all of our students, we didn't know this, but they had a trigger word that they were waiting for us to say. And as soon as they did, they all had these full water balloons in their bags that they pulled out and, and threw at me and Jennifer in the front of the room. And the, the kicker was that they hadn't filled them up enough. And so none of the water balloons broke. It was basically like they were just pelting us with sandbags. Um, so it was it was truly delightful. Um, yeah, and then the, the one thing I wanna, I just wanna add on to that is, um, Helen, you asked a great question, which is, you know, having humor and pranks and all of these things, how do we know, how do we make sure that we're keeping things safe? How do we make sure that we're not crossing a line? And um, the three things that, that our students have found most helpful are, um, number one, start by recognizing it's not about you. So don't ask, will this make me sound funny? Instead, ask, how will this make other people feel? And you will catch 80% of the things that, that aren't going to go well or are going to cross a line if you just flip that framing. Not how's this going to make me look, but instead how's this going to make other people feel when I throw this out there. Um, the second one is never punch down. So that means never making fun of someone of lower status. And of course, this means that as you rise in status in an organization, your playing field changes. So this is why we see some leaders getting into trouble, making jokes that maybe would have worked when they were junior um, you know, poking fun at someone who is more senior, but might not work when they're the leader. And then the third thing is check your distance. So how close are you personally to what you're making light of? Um, you know, I can make fun of my mother, but not Jennifer's mother. Who I hear is wonderful. She is a saint. <laughs> Thank you for knowing that. But, you know, checking your personal distance to what you're making light of and, and just making sure that you have the personal lived experience to be making light of that thing. So you've, you've described a, lot, a little bit about what it's like um, in the class. I'm actually really curious, like, how did you persuade Stanford Graduate School of Business to actually be OK with a class on humor? And how do you grade your students, especially if they're pelting you with uh, water bombs? <laughs> well, they all fail. If they do really good water balloons, then they pass. But you know, when the water balloons are not filled up. Um, so Stanford's incredibly entrepreneurial and um, and we just got a great set of deans that really are very open to proposals. And you know, for in this case, it just really came down to the research, which is clear on three things. First, you know, humor has this transformative effect on both our 
behavior and our psychology. Um, our mental health, which has been on the decline, um, not just in the last couple of years, but also more generally, um, is something to really be thinking about systematically and thoughtfully, not to mention creativity and productivity and feelings of closeness with others. Um, and humor is really this, this you know, secret weapon that, that fuels all of these things. And we're not studying the science of it. Second, it's completely under leveraged at work. As Naomi mentioned, a lot of people that used to use humor, maybe when there were lower levels of status, now feel like they can't. And in the culture um, that we're living in, often find that we're living in a humorless world. And it's just not true. Um, just better understanding that we all have different humor styles. It's not like you're either funny or you're not. Everyone has a different humor style. And when you understand everyone's humor styles, not to mention your own, and you understand the advantages of each style and the risks associated with each style, you can start to navigate the world in really pretty nimble, um, adept ways. Um, so our workplaces don't need to be so humorless. And then third, it's a teachable skill. You know, most people believe that, you know, you're either humorous or you're not. Untrue. It's a teachable skill. And these small shifts in behavior and attitude are sufficient to, to shift the way people not just experience work, but, but life. So that was compelling, I guess. And they said yes. And how are you grading them? Well, you know, there's the water balloon um, quality as well. But no, actually, there's a lot of things that we do um, in our class that are highly quantitative and experiential. And, you know, we don't, we, we really don't go um, into like, you know, why you passed or failed. We we kind of grade on a, on a pass-fail basis. It's but, it, but what's surprising about it is, A, how many hours they put in to each quarter. So we always monitor hours, you know, invested in homework and the readings and the videos and all of that. And our students are operating at, you know, surprisingly high levels just in terms of investment um, in the class and what they seem to get and, out of it. And credit, that they get, they get the same credit as um, for a class about humor as they do for financial accounting. So that's, you know... I love that. Oh, That's fantastic. All right. I think we're going to open it up for some uh, audience questions. Great. All right. Here we go. So our first question from Molly. How do you encourage people to develop, manifest their senses of humor in large, diverse, global environments like Google, where different people or groups have very different conceptions of what is funny? Love so, that question. Yes. You go first, Naomi. Um, the jokes are not universal. Laughter is universal. And so instead of going for jokes, um, go for little moments of levity where you show a bit, a broader range of yourself. Um, yeah, it, there, there's this idea that laughter is a fundamental melody of human conversation. You know, like we all, we all recognize it. We all want to jump in and sing the tune when we hear it. Um, and so that can be really effective tactically. What we tell people to do, especially when they're working um, across cultures, is to get to know the humor style of the culture that you're working with. So we have one manager we work with who does um, quite a bit of work in Singapore. And what this woman chose to do was she reached out to her local Singapore team and she said, I want everyone from the team to submit either a meme or a video or just something that you find funny. And then she took those uh, those examples of humor and during her team meetings, she would use their examples of humor during her presentation. So rather than imposing on them, this is what I think is funny, she was sort of saying, hey, I hear you and I wanna understand your sense of humor and bringing that to light um, during, you know, during meetings. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add is, you know, a lot of the, um the different executives or students we work with, they'll find that when they understand their humor style, so they'll, you know, if there's the stand up and then there's the magnet and the sniper and the sweetheart, there's four different styles. And so if you want to understand your style, you just go to humorseriously.com, fill out a two minute quiz and it reports back this report. And then they have their teams do it and they share out the results. And all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, Naomi, she is a magnet, which is more charismatic, sometimes a little silly, a little goofy, lights up a room when they enter in, but she also can shift styles, but they, you start to learn, oh, you know, Naomi's a magnet. So when she 
says something or when she leads in a certain way or she suggests a certain way, that that lens of understanding where she's coming from, you know, authentically colors the way that you interpret her words. And it becomes so much easier to communicate, to get on the same page, to create a you know, an inclusive environment that's useful. I even make my kids do the humor quiz um, once a quarter because, you know, their humor style might change. And it's really been transformative, even from a family perspective, just understanding what makes you laugh, what is your style, and what is the style of others around you. And what's your style, Jennifer? I've always been a sniper, but I had a, a significant humor fail, especially earlier on. Um, um, well, a couple times in my life, they're scarring, right? Helen, like if you've ever like bombed and offended someone, it, it can stay with you. And that's what happened to me um, early on. And so I just really shifted to a sweetheart, which is more understated and honest and more inclusive. And it's less about sort of you and more about the others. It's not necessarily known as being funny. Um, it's a very different, you know, kind of humor style, but it's one that's really effective um, when you have higher levels of status too. Well, you and me both. I took the quiz and I was squarely in the sweetheart camp. Okay, let's bring up another audience question. Okay, from Teddy, when humor is met with crickets, what do you do next? I just wanna say I love the vulnerability of this question. My humor is met with, <laughs> with crickets frequently. Okay, so yeah, it's a great question, Teddy. What do you do when you fail? And um, I would say there are two different types of fails. One is the, it's totally appropriate in a work context. You, you say a joke and it totally fails. What do you do then? Um, the most effective thing oftentimes is to lean in and just name it. So say something like, well, that didn't work or, you know, thanks, I'll be here all day. Just naming the fact that you didn't get a laugh will often cut the tension enough to get a laugh or at least or at least show your self-awareness that you know that that didn't quite go well. When you cross a line or you do something inappropriate, that's a very different scenario. And we have a whole chapter in our book about what to do when you cross a line. Um, but the most important thing is genuinely acknowledge it, get curious about what was your blind spot? What didn't you understand? What, where was the empathy fail um, that led you to this humor fail so that you can learn from it and, uh, and not make the same mistake in the future? Anything you would add, Jennifer? Um, no, I thought that was fantastic. It is such an important question, though. Um, we have a couple different frameworks to think about, you know, truth, pain, distance, like, you know, as you analyze why there might have been crickets or some uncomfortability, you know, you can analyze it, you know, from this, like, you know, was it too soon? Or was I not, you know, close enough to the subject um, of which I was making fun of? Um, more practically, you know, having a set of trusted testers, you know, a couple of people in the organization that might actually, you know, allow you to get, you know, warm feedback on how you use humor is something that that's practically actually quite good. Even if you do land something and it, it's met with, with crickets, just kind of isolating one trusted tester or one trusted person in the uh, meetings to do kind of a follow-up is, is an easy way to approach that. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Um, let's bring up another audience question. Okay, from Bora. I notice that people often use self-deprecating humor. Does this type of humor have the same positive effects that you've mentioned, or is it counterproductive? Love this question. Whoa. This is both, both, yeah. Um, so this is such a great question, and it, it relates to, Helen, what you brought up earlier, which is women leaders in particular can sometimes hold back their humor. Um, so self-deprecation is this really interesting form of humor where when you are lower status, it can actually diminish perceptions of status because people code your self-deprecation or they can code your self-deprecation as genuine um, lack of confidence. But once you, once you get to be higher status, it's an incredible superpower because people will code your self-deprecation as you're confident, you're not taking yourself too seriously, you're giving other people permission to use their sense of humor. And so Bora, um, the answer is both. And the one thing I will say as it relates to gender, um, Helen, to your question earlier is, we tend to find that our female leaders can over-index on self-deprecation in particular. This goes to sort of how little 
boys and girls play differently on the playground, how we're raised differently, um, a longer conversation and a whole book about that. Um, but the, the general wisdom is if you are a sweetheart or a magnet style, you might be prone to over indexing on self deprecation. And so that can be a pitfall for you and it can take away status if you do it too much. Jennifer, anything to add to that? No, it was perfect. What? It was beautiful. It was a piece of art. I taped it. <laughs> I, I well, did. Actually, know, so it was gorgeous. I was going to say, you'll have the recording to revisit it again. Perfect. All right, let's bring up another audience question. Okay, Janica, how can you foster a sense of humor on a team that is very serious when your humor isn't responded to in kind? Quit oh, the team. that is such a good question. Just kidding. How can you foster a sense of humor on a team that's very serious when your humor isn't responded to in kind? I'll take a whack at it um, first, and then Naomi, I'm super interested in what you might say. I'm going to go with, um, you know, just getting on the same. You know, first, this is not about you know being funny. It's not about even humor at some level. It's first about trust, right? And how do you create that trust in the team, especially if you're going to start playing with humor? So again, it's really been um, really useful, at least for me and a lot of the people we work with, to understand what is your humor style and what is their humor style? Because for example, snipers, you know, they're, they tend to be really smart. Um, they are dry and and um, and sly. They're the, the masters of the unexpected dig. So, like Bill Burr, for example, or Michelle Wolf is a sniper. A lot of times, um, when people are snipers, so they appreciate humor, but they're very hard to smile. So you're reading the room and no one's laughing, and you think humor might not be their valued or it might not be your type. Well, it just might be that they are a sniper. It's very hard to make snipers laugh. In sharp contrast to like magnets, for example. So I find this idea of like understanding their humor style and sharing your own to be a good way to start. I totally agree with that. Um, so I I had an experience with a colleague who I will call Shelly. Um, and Shelly and I, uh, she actually was on my team. And I remember, I, you know, it was so important to me that we had humor together, that we were laughing together. And so I'm a magnet style. So I would come in and be like goofy and silly with her and I would get nothing. And my reaction to that was be, to be goofier and to be sillier with her to try and draw her out. And uh, then I went on this trip with my sister and we were traveling to Lithuania. We did this heritage trip and uh, went to all the countries that our, that our, that our families are from. And I remember this moment during the trip, watching um, an American try and talk to a Lithuanian at the train station. And this Lithuanian person didn't speak English. And the American did that thing that sometimes we Americans do that's so aggravating, where instead of opening up a translation book and trying to get out some phrases in Lithuanian, they talked louder and louder in English. And I had this moment watching this American make this incredible faux pas that, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm doing to Shelly. Cause here I am a magnet, she's not responding. And so I'm speaking louder and louder and magnet humor to her. And so I got back from my trip and I know about Shelly that she loves cats and that she always talks about how her cat has a really big head. So I went out and I bought a little cat, like a human with a cat head bobblehead and I didn't say a word to her. I just went and left it on her desk. And then I quietly went back to my desk and she burst out laughing. And it became this little joke where she would hide it on my desk. And then I would like quietly hide it back on her desk. And by me recognizing her humor style and taking a step in her direction, it was able to unlock humor in our relationship in a way that was totally not possible had I kept going in my own style. But that raises an interesting question is when you're meeting someone for the first time, like how you don't have a good gauge of what their humor style is. So how do you approach sort of making sure that your humor style isn't going to become overwhelming or isn't going to put people off? Like, do you tread tentatively? Do you just go for it? I'm just curious how you deal with your humor style when you're um, meeting complete strangers. Well, one, one thing, it kind of goes back to what Naomi had said before. It's not about being funny, so don't worry about that. Just decrease the pressure. It's just about 
what what does the room need? What does the other person need? How do you make others feel? So especially in the early moments of, of meeting someone, um, you know, kind of leaning into that more than anything else. And then a second tip, I think, yeah, beyond like don't don't like go in for like the fast joke necessarily. It's just about being more human. So thinking about Secretary Albright, you know, wearing a bug, which kind of invites a conversation. It's not in your face. Um, that's the second way of thinking about it. Oh, that's helpful. All right, I think we have one more audience question. All right, from Amanda. What if you get feedback that your humor is more of a distraction than help? Then you might be a magnet style. Buy <laughs> <laughs> so, a cat bobblehead. There you go. Um, no, it's it's a great question. And, um, and it points to this important point that each of the humor styles is predisposed to a different set of risks. And so self-awareness around your humor style can help you mitigate that kind of feedback. So for example, I know as a magnet that I can over-index on silliness, on goofiness, and that I can get feedback that that's detrimental to you know, the goals of the session if I do it too much. Um, you know, Each of those styles has upsides and has potential downsides, which we don't have time to go into all of them right now. Um, but I would guess, Amanda, that that might you might find yourself a magnet if that is an issue for you. Um, and it's just really about recognizing what are your strengths, what are your pitfalls, and recalibrating based on the context. All right. Well, I would thank the audience for the questions that they put forward. I think we've got three or four minutes left. So I'd love to just get into some rapid fire questions um, to end. So Schitt's Creek or Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. All right, that was pretty definitive. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm a big fan of Shit's Creek. Yeah. Oh All right, favorite, God. I know, I've got to get Apple TV. Uh, favorite comedian? Chloe Feynman on SNL. I have too many, I have far too many. I'll name one person I'm loving right now, um, Bowen Yang, also on SNL. Okay. Uh, who's the person that inspires you the most? Leslie Blodgett is a dear friend and complete inspiration. Um, I know this is lightning rounds. So I won't go into details. Um, again, too many people to name, but someone who I met recently, um, Rishi Kesh Herway, who creates um, Sound Exploder and has an incredible, incredible TED Talk that will be coming out soon um, about how we can listen to each other more fully and more compassionately. Okay. Where is your favorite place to think? Um, so it's not so much a place as much as it is a, uh, a position. So I can think really well laying down, looking up at the sky or looking up in general. So laying down anywhere. Uh, for me in the back country, I go on two uh, big backpacking trips a year, totally out of service. Um, and I do my best thinking there. All right. Clean desk or messy desk? Obsessively clean. Um, obsessively messy, which really comes in handy when you need something to throw to put on the light sensors and they're the like, they're like pulling things in reach. <laughs> Perfect. And last but not least, what is your favorite never fail joke? <laughs> okay. So, all right. A guy walks into a doctor's office and his doctor's there with him. And he says, I have two pieces of good, bad news, bad news, not good news, bad news. And the doctor says, what are they? And, you know, uh, first answer is the first piece of bad news um, of news is that you have cancer. Mm -hmm. And then the patient asks, what's the second piece of news? And the doctor says, the second piece of bad news is that you have Alzheimer's. And the man laughs and says, well, at least I don't have cancer. Oh. That's pretty good. It's a little dark, but it's good. <laughs> okay. Um, mine is participatory um, and it's actually like pretty serious. Um, so if everyone could participate, that'd be great. Okay. So I want everyone to point up to the ceiling and make a circle with your finger as if you're drawing a perfect circle on the ceiling and go faster and faster. Yep, everyone's doing great as fast as you can. Knock, knock. Everyone's gonna need to be off mute for this. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Uh, woo. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo, we did it. Good woo talk, everyone. Way to go. My deepest apologies for that. Thank you for being game. 
Happy to participate anytime. And with that, thank you both so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Naomi. Fabulous talk. I really enjoyed it. So appreciate all the insights that you've shared. I strongly encourage everybody to read the book, which I absolutely loved. And I think with that, it is a wrap. We're so, thank you so much for having us. And we thank you all for- gift for you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, um, we created a little three week boot camp, and we'll give you a little bit more details, but we're giving you all um, a discount. We are so appreciative of your time. And I think it'll be really fun for the group too. Totally. And then also just thank you personally, Helen, because you embody this work every single day with your team and it is an inspiration to see and, um, and we need more people like you in the world. So thanks for being out there and, and doing exactly this. Yeah. We go. appreciate that. And we've got to get your message out to more people. So it really works. Thank right. you. Bye Helen. Thanks. thanks.